In the weeks after the death of my brother, I found myself looking for comfort on the internet. Around four months had passed and I discovered a forum created for twins dealing with the grief of losing their other twin. Whether from ending their own life or illness, thousands across the world were brought together for this one singular purpose. I admit I was somewhat shy about posting and remained a bit of a lurker. However, as I became more comfortable with the community, I grew into a daily poster and was able to befriend many on the forum. A select few of these people and I became very close and did much to help one another to work through our grief. One member, a girl who said she was from Montana, probably did the most of all to help me move forward. She had lost her twin sister in a similar circumstance just as I had my brother and had a specific insight many others in the forum did not. It was not long until her and I were confessing our deepest secrets to each other and it was very nearly as if I hadn't lost my twin at all. You may ask why I would tell a complete stranger all my deepest and darkest secrets. I suppose the anonymity was the reason. Even if the person knows or thinks they know all about you, they still don't know your true identity and location. That aspect of the internet gives you carte blanche to bear your soul to a person you're confident doesn't know the true you. The connection we formed over my time on the forum was the best thing that could have happened to me at the time. However, my confidence in my anonymity and comfort with this person would ultimately come back to bite me and make my life on the internet and outside of it complete torture. It was an average ordinary morning when I discovered my friend's true face. I fired up my computer and opened my mail only to be overwhelmed by a barrage of angry and vicious messages. As I scrolled through each one, it soon became clear what was happening. Someone very close to me had dumped all my terrible secrets onto the forum and wider internet. I tried to, deny it to myself for a long time, who the identity of the person was, but I was eventually forced to face the facts. Apparently, my supposed friend on the forum had told everyone there some of my private feelings towards my dead brother and the way in which he chose to end his life. We all have those opinions or feelings we keep to ourselves because we know they wouldn't be popular with those around us. I never said anything terrible or anything like that, but most of my words surrounded my anger toward my twin. I probably could have phrased some of them better, but that's the fatal flaw of the internet. Without context or hearing the person's tone of voice, things can get lost or misconstrued. Over a short time, the situation would become far worse. The threatening messages started. People I had once called friends were now threatening my life. It wasn't just online, either. The messages were soon coming to my phone. This fact only proved to cement her guilt since she was one of the very few who had my number. The most terrifying aspect of the phone messages was that many knew my real name and address. This was when I truly came to fear for my life. I'd become a bawling and panicking mess. When I would finally sum up the courage to confront her about this, the pieces would all begin to fall into place. Her written reply laid it all out clearly. I had foolishly walked right into the clutches of a person who hated me and my family. My friend, all these months, turned out to be the drug-addicted ex-girlfriend of my brother. In my opinion, she was one of the major reasons he took his life, and my family agreed, which is why we had barred her from the funeral and anything taking place that day. She swore she'd get back at us, and boy, she did. Apparently, she had been on the forum one day and guessed who I was. Just to be sure, she pretended to be a bereaved twin and started to suck up to me. Once it became obvious that I was who she thought I was, she saw it as an opportunity to get her revenge. In hindsight, things were starting to make more sense. She'd always been a bit pushy when trying to get me to tell her a secret. To make me more comfortable, she'd tell me something, which we all know now was a load of BS, and I would always fall for it. All through her message, it was clear she had no remorse for what she had done. In fact, upon hearing of the many threats in my life, she decided to push things along by doxing me. What she hoped to happen had, and she was very pleased by the result. This final message was the last time I'd heard from her. No replies would come to my following emails, and soon after, I'd be forced to get a new address. After I spoke with my family and our lawyer, I took their advice and got rid of all my prior connections. This included having to move to a new place. 
I was, and still am, concerned about the remainder of my family. Although my brother's ex was able to get her revenge on me, the rest of them were assumed to still be in danger. My father assured me that they would be fine, and from all appearances, he may be correct, at least for now. I had stepped away from the internet for almost nine months, and am just now beginning to dip my foot back into the pool. Naturally, I will never return to the forum in which all these problems spawned, even though I've not yet had any run-ins with anyone from there, I will never again expose myself to the level of being identified. Even the account from which this story has been sent is a one-time use throwaway, so if any of those coming across this story may have any questions, I'm sorry. None will be forthcoming anytime soon, and certainly not from this account. If there's anything you can take away from this mishap, perhaps it is a lesson of caution. I and many others have discovered to our detriment how big of a sewer the internet can be. Like the sewer, there lurk many rats. On the internet, the rats are waiting and hiding to destroy others. Many have no reasons. They're just evil. I suppose I'm trying to advise you all to be careful and remember that no one on the internet is really your friend unless you know them in real life. And although many perils linger there, the internet is not real life. This happened a very long time ago. I just turned 13 and, as ashamed as I am to admit it, I was head over heels in love with Justin Bieber. Although it's plain as the nose on my face now that he's the king of cheese, back then I was convinced I was going to be his wife and nobody was going to tell me otherwise. Due to my blind allegiance to the Biebs, I would comb the internet on a daily basis in search of pages or forums about him. I was overjoyed the day I discovered a new forum that alleged to be the official Justin Bieber forum. Of course, I would join right away and began making posts pledging my undying love for him. Within a matter of months, I became one of the top posters. This honor was beginning to make me feel somewhat popular within his fandom. However, like most other young people, I was growing bored with the same names and starting to search for a new place dedicated to my beloved Justin. A few days of Yahoo searches led me to a relatively new forum with a chat room. Once again, I joined up as fast as I could and started looking for folks to talk to. The first few weeks, the room was almost dead. This didn't bother me though. I saw it as a chance to be in at the ground floor of something new and even maybe get the attention of Justin himself. The following weeks showed a great amount of growth in the forum and boatloads of fans soon began to pour in. I would welcome the new members one by one and thought of them all as my friends. One girl and I began chatting and became besties in no time. After talking back and forth for a few months we discovered that I lived in the next town over. Since we were the two biggest Bieber fans it was only logical we should meet. So, on a Sunday morning in August, I badgered my mom into taking me to a park on the edge of town to meet my best friend. I tried to get my mom to drop me off and leave, but she wouldn't. I was so worried she was going to embarrass me. After all, my friend, we'll call her Zoe, assured me she lived nearby and her mom could bring me home. Mom wasn't having it, and I'm so very thankful she wasn't. The plan was for us to meet at a picnic table in the far end of the park. Zoe said it was just a few yards from her door and she'd walk over when she saw me arrive. I sat at the table and waited. About five minutes passed before I was approached by a middle-aged man. He asked me my name and I hesitated to answer. So, he quickly explained that Zoe had sent him to get me. She was unable to come over right then, but if I followed him, he'd take me over to the house. I had no reason to not trust him, but something about him scared me. I told him I'd wait, but he continued trying to convince me. As he started to get closer, I began stepping backwards. The look on his face became wilder and wilder with each step. I finally gave up on the pretense and blurted out that I didn't believe him. Once this was said, his eyes bulged out and he lunged and tried to grab me. I let out a scream and continued moving backward, now at a faster pace. When I was sure I had enough space, I turned and ran for my mom's car. The distance between the table and the car seemed like a mile. I could hear him running behind me and he was getting closer by the second. 
When I caught sight of our car, I began screaming for my mom as loud as I could. If I could make it to the car, I was sure I'd be safe. I was about 50 yards from the car and my mom got out and began running to me. She had the most terrified look I'd ever seen on her face. We met one another a few steps from the car and she grabbed me and began asking me what was wrong. I turned around to show her, but the strange man was gone. A feeling of relief washed over me. I turned back to her and attempted to explain what had just happened. It's a miracle she understood a word, but she listened intently and led me back to the car. From there, we drove directly to the police station down the road and I told the police the whole story. My computer was taken and... I was without any connection to the internet. At that time, I was still unsure what had really happened and wanted to talk to Zoe again. My mom wouldn't let me use her laptop to do it, and it wasn't until she explained to me what had been going on did I understand the seriousness of the situation. Even then, the police had to map out every little aspect of it before I'd accept that Zoe wasn't real. This fact hit me like a truck. I probably cried for a whole week. Not only did I feel stupid about being tricked and scared from very nearly getting abducted, I felt like my best friend had just died. It all seemed so childish in retrospect, but that's just what I was then. A child, and one that didn't know any better. The guy who had orchestrated everything was eventually caught and convicted. The police were almost positive he had done the same thing to at least one other girl, but he wasn't talking. He took a plea bargain, so... There was no trial. I don't know if I would have had the guts to testify if there had been. Since then, I've went through the counseling process and it helped me a lot. At least now I can laugh about it. When I grew up, I was determined that all those I love would have it drilled into their heads that people aren't always who they claim to be on the internet. The day my younger sister first logged on, I spent almost an hour telling her my story and about the other hundreds of dangers online. I did my best not to scare her, but it is very important to me and my mom that she be prepared. Yesterday was her 13th birthday, and I reminded her one last time to be careful. Since it was all fresh in my mind, I figured I'd write it down and share it. My hopes are that others will show it to the young people in their lives so they will have the skills to navigate the net in a safer way and not have the same experience as I did. Tracy Blair was the oldest of three born to Tony and Kirk Blair. By all accounts, the girl was a happy and friendly child, as was her home life. The fast-growing family had just recently moved to a larger and more modern home across town, and Tracy was said to be somewhat saddened by the move and feared she would lose all friends she'd made. However, once it became apparent most would stay in contact, her attitude would change for the better. Although she was able to keep most of her older friends, she didn't hesitate to make new ones online. Her experience with the internet had just begun and many of the hazards that went along with it would need to be learned quickly. Despite her innate suspicion of strangers, the girl was still young and trusting of those around her age. Unfortunately, an unknown man with evil intent would use this trust to his advantage. On a foggy morning in 2015, Tracy would disappear from her home never to be seen again. From what is known, she had recently been in contact with someone posing as her 18-year-old boyfriend. They had been chatting back and forth in Japanese animation chat rooms and the boy was doing his utmost to get Tracy to meet him. The chat logs show that she was very reluctant to do so. Multiple times she tried to express upon him the seriousness of the situation, especially as to her age. Tracy was barely 14 at the time and well aware of the legality surrounding any relationship they may have. The young girl seemed to be more interested in making friends rather than anything more intimate, but he didn't appear to be catching on to her signals. By November, his many months of badgering had finally paid off. Tracy agreed to meet with him early that morning prior to leaving for school. She believed her parents would be none the wiser and she turned out to be right. The young girl obviously had no idea what laid ahead of her. Everything she held dear, except her cell phone, was left behind, so any talk of her running away could be discounted. Thousands of hours of police work have gone into the investigation, and despite having a long trail of chat logs between her and the unknown boy, 
The computer forensics team are still no closer to tracing his name or location. The team doubts many 18-year-olds would have the extensive computer knowledge this individual appears to have and are going with the assumption it was an older male. This theory is supported by a similar case in which an unknown middle-aged man had been posing as a teenage male. This man had also convinced another teenage girl to meet with him. On the day of the meet, he had attempted to abduct the girl, but a family picnicking nearby heard the girl's screams and drove the man away. The man was able to escape and is still at large as of the time of this writing. The similarities between the two cases have convinced authorities that Tracy was likely the victim of this same perpetrator. How many other young females have fallen for this ruse is unknown. However, what can be almost positive of is that he, or those like him, may be online attempting to gain the trust of another child this very minute. So I please ask all of you to educate your children on the dangers of the web and monitor their contact online. They also want it to be known that they are still working diligently on Tracy's case and hope she will be found safe very soon. In the meantime, the safety of your own children should be foremost in your mind. If you have any information about Tracy's disappearance, detectives ask you to contact your local law enforcement officials. After being ejected from a large metal detector forum in 2009, I thought it would be a great idea to create a forum of my own. So a few months later I did just that. Unfortunately the lifespan of my baby wasn't that long, finally closed up shop around the end of 2013, but it managed to attract a decent number of people and even a few relatively well known members. While I would eventually make a good few friends from the endeavor on one particular evening, I got a private message from a man I wish I'd never met. The man who called himself Oscar contacted me in the early spring of 2011. He had been a member of the forum almost since its inception and sounded like a nice and knowledgeable guy. At some point in the last few months, he had realized I lived very close to him and thought I would be the perfect man to message. Oscar had been planning a very bare bones expedition out to the mountains where he believed a lot of treasure was hidden. I guess because of my connections and experience of the local hills, he felt I could benefit him in being the second member of the trip. I was somewhat familiar with the story of the treasure and had prospected in the area. Despite this, I harbored many doubts about the existence of it. During the next several months, I expressed these to him in countless messages back and forth. I will admit his enthusiasm and certainty excited me at times but it would take far more proof before I would agree to join him. He would bring me the proof in the following weeks, and I would finally agree to be his partner. A month later, after the rains had completely ceased, we drove away from town and, hopefully, into the arms of a lot of treasure. Now the hard work had truly began, and hard it was. Day after day, we toiled in the dirt, digging and moving massive rocks only to uncover nothing. It took a while before we would realize we had read the map wrong and had reversed course. The hiking was far harder than it had been in the past and with no real obvious clues, I began to lose hope. Then, out of nowhere, we stumbled across a whole new mystery. We'd been hiking all day and were looking for a good place to camp when Oscar stepped into a small hole that turned out to be a lost mine. For the remainder of the night I tossed and turned eager for the search that would come with the dawn. It eventually came and we spent a good three hours digging out the entrance to make it large enough to enter. Around lunch it was big enough for me to crawl into. I did so for a good fifty feet when it opened up into a larger room about knee high. As I shone my light around I came to realize it had been cleaned out long ago. This wasn't the first time I'd had the same experience but I promise it never gets easier. I went ahead and knocked off some samples to get assayed and took a few pictures to show Oscar and shimmy back out. As I related what I had seen inside the mine, Oscar's expression grew dimmer and dimmer. Even after handing him the samples, he appeared to be angry at me. It wasn't that big of a deal, really. After all, we still had the treasure to find. He threw the samples down at my feet and huffed. You trying to screw me? The scowl uncovering his teeth as he said it. 
I know what this is. You're trying to trick me and come back for it, so it's all yours. As the last words dropped from his mouth, his right hand moved towards his pistol. I glanced up to his eyes, hoping to measure his seriousness. They had morphed from a bright blue to almost black. He wasn't joking. Any bit of saliva I'd once had in my mouth was gone in an instant and I could feel my body begin to tremble. I was surely seconds away from death. There was a 45 strapped to my belt too, but I was far from a shootist and he had the drop on me. The best I could hope for was to talk my way out of it. Oscar, I, I promise I have no intention of doing anything like that. I couldn't stop the stutter in my voice. My hands fumbled for my phone. L look, I took pictures. His hand tightened on the grip of the pistol, but he held his draw. I handed him the phone, almost dropping it at least once. He stared at the screen intently for several minutes in complete silence, occasionally flipping from page to page. I didn't dare move or speak as he did so. However, my eyes stayed glued to his gun hand the entire time while I said a silent prayer. My hope was that he had as much experience as me and would know the mine was played out. When he did finally speak, I jumped slightly because I was so focused on his gun. Alright, Wayne. It looks like you may be telling the truth. From these pictures, it looks to be cleaned out, but if I come back here and see somebody's been digging, I'm going to track you down and put a bullet in you. I did my best to hide my relief. He handed me my phone and we headed down to the mountain. I was overjoyed to be leaving. As we descended, I kept my eyes fixed on his pistol, just in case he'd try to catch me off guard. No more words were exchanged between us. Once my car came into sight, I hustled my tail as fast as my legs would carry me, but never let him get behind me. I hightailed it out of there, happy just to be getting out of the mountains alive and having long forgotten anything to do with treasure. It was clear I was never going out with that crazy man again. I'd always read old stories about how prospectors would get gold fever and kill each other, but never believed I'd be put in the same predicament. Oscar did try to connect with me a few times more, but after what happened the first time, he had to know I'd never be able to trust him again. The chance he was trying to lure me out to him so he could kill me was too high. Thankfully, I'd forgotten to give him my address. At least I could check the mail without carrying a gun with me, I'd hoped. In the years since this happened, I've been out and about detecting for this and that, always looking out for my old partner over my shoulder. Since I shut down the forum, I've taken to lurking around, never posting any information that may let him know who I am or if I'm still alive. Occasionally I come across one of his posts and move along, but the most recent of his I saw caused me to shudder when I read it. It appears he's on the search for a new partner to accompany him on his next treasure hunt. For a long moment I thought about posting a warning or at least telling of my experience with him in the mountains, but I decided against it. I've stayed safe all these years keeping my head down and never believed in poking a sleeping bear. I can only hope his posts go unanswered. I don't know if I could live with the knowledge that I could have prevented a tragedy and chose to stay silent. Just this past week, my sister shared with me a terrifying tale of a small group of predators working out of the Major Kids Entertainment Forum. She'd only just discovered the group's existence in this past month. Her daughter had been a member of this forum for many years by this point, but had never reported any strange interactions with an adult. Although grown-up members are not unheard of on this site, its overwhelming aim is to cater toward children under 16 years or younger. My niece is currently approaching 14 and her own interest in this subject has waned drastically in the last few years. Nonetheless, she has made many friends through the forum and enjoys connecting with them on a fairly regular basis. The dangers lurking on the site have been brought to her attention by a poster on Reddit. The poster told a story of how her son had been approached by two different men on the forum to meet for intimate reasons. One of them had been building up to it at first befriending the 12-year-old, talking a lot of their common love for music and animation. 
The other was much more brazen in his actions, even going as far as sending illicit pictures. By the time the mother had discovered the existence of the man and went to the police, both had moved on or changed their usernames. Despite a lot of hard work, the police were unable to track either one and several operations to draw them out failed. In the comments below the post, another parent shared the details of a similar incident in which his son was propositioned by an adult man for photos. Just like my sister, I was disgusted by the stories I read on the Reddit page and was thankful I was childless. These awful accounts didn't stick to the realm of Reddit for long. After having an in-depth discussion on internet safety with her daughter, my niece took it upon herself to ask her friend if they had been approached or propositioned by an adult on that forum or the internet in general. What she discovered would shock even her. No less than six of her friends, male and female, had been approached and solicited for a variety of services. Two of those also personally knew someone who had been assaulted by an adult that they had been groomed by on the internet. The thing about all this that concerned us the most was that three of them had been solicited on that specific forum. Both of the children, one of each gender, had even had this happen several times during their time being a member. With all she had heard over the last few weeks, my sister was terrified and saw only these kinds of monsters behind every tree. She even considered making her daughter end her membership on the forum, but I managed to help her see how that may drive a wedge between her and my niece. The girl was only there to speak to her friends anyway, and forbidding her from doing that wouldn't keep her safe from the predators that existed there. She was going to have to trust her to make her own decisions. The girl was becoming a woman, and I was positive that she had been raised well enough to make the correct ones. God, I hope I'm right. Every once in a blue moon, I like to log on to the deep web and search for weird and strange things. In general, it's a relatively tame place. All the stories you hear about red rooms and hitmen are bull 99% of the time, and these sites you see covered on YouTube are just FBI and other various law enforcement agencies' honey traps set up to capture criminals and stupid kids looking to score online. The majority of the trafficking taking place on the deep web these days is insiders leaking information to journalists and pervs sharing lewd photos of kids. Yes, there are many other uses for it, but the virtual anonymity of the platform allows these behaviors to thrive. I would like to make it clear I wholly support whistleblowers having a safe place to pass on information they might have, by the way, but obviously not the illicit stuff that people do on there. And the story that I'm about to share occurred in my early days surfing the deep web. I had heard all the stories and was eager to see how real they were. Like others, I was a little disappointed in what I'd found. The raciest place I'd come across was a picture and video forum that was heavy on the adult stuff. I guess the best description of it is a deep web X hamster crossed with live leak. Everything was allowed as long as it was legal. So the kid stuff was banned, thankfully. The adult videos were the main reason I was there, I'm not gonna lie. A lot of the other members traded their homemade videos and pictures between one another and I enjoyed checking those posts out. Most of the modern mainstream adult movies are a little degrading to the actresses, but I discovered the amateur stuff was not. Pretty vanilla, actually. This made them much easier for me to enjoy. It may have been my third or fourth time I'd visited the site when I got a private message from another member. I wasn't sure why he chose me or even how he knew I was there at the time but I read it anyway. He said he was a moderator and noticed I'd visited multiple times but had not shared anything. Apparently the sharing thing while not required was highly encouraged. He wanted to know if I had anything to share, basically. I've never been the kind to film myself doing it, however I didn't want to cause any trouble. After thinking about it for a minute, I remember I had a few photos of my ex-girlfriend's older sister she had sent me. Don't ask and so I sent those. Thirty minutes later, he sent a second message. He sounded pleased with the pictures and had a few files I could download. Despite being grateful, I was a tad bit leery of downloading something from a stranger, but my curiosity got the best of me. The first few videos were pretty average yet enjoyable. However, the next was a bit unsettling. 
It was a guy slapping his female partner over and over and then choking her with a length of rope. I skipped that one completely and moved on, but the next one was even worse. The video started with a close-up of a woman's leg wearing a spiked high heel. Then it pulled away to show a kitten laying on the floor. This confused me for a second, but then the woman raised her leg and stomped on the kitten. I spent the next several minutes weeping uncontrollably. Being a massive animal lover, this kind of garbage horrifies me. Call me a child all you want, but there was nothing appealing about this. The tears eventually gave over to sheer anger, and I sent a venom-laden message to this idiot voicing my distaste for his joke. I let my anger get the best of me, and I foolishly threatened to send them to the cops. Looking back on this now, it was an empty threat. The cops wouldn't likely be able to find the guy or really care. After witnessing what I had, I stayed off the deep web for about a month. When I did return, I noticed a new message from the guy that sent me the horrible videos. I was reluctant to read it at first, kind of wanted to move on and put it behind me, but another part of me wanted to see his justification for thinking I'd like that garbage. Ultimately, I made the right choice, or maybe not. It depends on perspective, I guess. What I would read, I was not expecting. For some reason, he got into his head that I didn't belong on the forum, and he wanted to drive me away. My mistake was threatening him. He must have foreseen this, and he suggested I search my hard drive. He claimed he had hidden a file within the download that had enough CP to put me in prison for a long time. This left me with no defense. A search of my hard drive uncovered an unknown file that I didn't recognize, and it was indeed a massive file. Although it may have been nothing, there was no way I was going to take the chance of infecting my computer with this filth. Hours of work left me with no hope of removing it. Perhaps a more computer literate person could do it, but I was not one of those. I battled around with it in my mind for a long time until I saw no other option. A sledgehammer made quick work of the laptop. In less than ten minutes, my problem was solved and I'd learned my lesson. From that day on, I'll never download anything unless I know for certain it is safe. Since then, I only peruse the deep web on a used and disposable laptop I purchased just for that purpose. In addition, I don't engage with anyone there and to be honest, I find less and less that draws me back. The surface web has plenty of free stuff to consume and the dangers are far less. If you do find yourself lurking around the deep web, keep in mind that most of the folks there are using it for a reason. Most have something to hide or unseemly work to do. Please, be safe and don't trust anyone. Sometimes the things we say to others can come back to haunt us. Even when it's someone we think we know well, words and intent can become twisted, especially over the internet. This next story should serve as a strong reminder to be careful of what you may say to others. Although you may mean them no harm, not everyone can take a joke. At the end of 2012, I stumbled upon a male-centered chat room run by one of those men's fashion and style magazines. I lurked for a week or two before I decided to officially join the discussion. The topics thrown around were what you would imagine a bunch of 18 to 45 year old guys would talk about to one another. Women, beer, guns, the usual things. Another very common thing you will see if you spend any amount of time around men is harmless banter. The old yo mama jokes and the type. On occasion, the mean spirited fellow will come along and take things too far but normally most lines are rarely crossed. That being said, almost every one of us men have said something that offended another without meaning to. While speaking face to face, your meaning can occasionally be misconstrued, but online, the chances of this happening can increase greatly and thinking of what you're about to say is very important. On one occasion, I said something I didn't feel was that bad, but every day since then I've wished I could take it back. I believe I'd been a member of the chat for over a year then. The room was relatively active, and I was one of the most active. I traded friendly barbs back and forth with others on many occasions, and nothing ever became of it. One morning over coffee, I was BSing with a group of three or four other members. All but one guy were long-timers. 
the fourth dude had been around for less than a month. That didn't matter to us, though. Regardless of how long you've been around, we welcomed everyone with open arms. If I recollect right, the new guy had made a joking comment about his wife and the others of us did the same. Up to then, all was well with the group, but then I made my own joke about the new guy's wife and everything broke out from there. To show how little I thought about it at the time, I can't even remember what the joke was about. If I was to guess, it was probably about her weight. If that was the subject, in hindsight, it was likely the wrong thing to mention, but in my defense, I'd heard much worse than things exchanged there and never blinked an eye. What was said doesn't matter. If it offended the man, I was out of line and take full responsibility for my actions now. That morning was a slightly different matter. Even after the guy told me I'd gone too far, I disregarded his words and told him to chill out and to stop being a wuss. I probably couldn't have said anything worse. The rest of the guys quietly left and he and I were the only two remaining. No reply came from his end for a long time and I was just about to log off when he began typing. He demanded I apologize that second or he was going to beat an apology out of me. Naturally, this made me chuckle. I replied by saying, What are you going to do? Reach through the screen and punch me? I still hate myself for being such an a-hole. I don't have to jerk off. I know exactly where you live and to make sure you're paying attention. I know your kids' names and what school they go to. Now, I was beginning to get angry myself. Threatening my children was way overboard. This made my response to him cruder than usual. I confidently called his bluff. To my surprise, he wasn't bluffing. He would follow by typing out my full address, including my children's full names, birth dates, and schools. He wanted my full attention, and he most certainly had it. I'd never been so terrified in my life. Just to drive his point home, he added by telling me that he lived in the next town over. Even if he was lying about that, I wasn't going to risk it. My reply to him was perhaps the most thought-out apology I'd ever given someone, and be sure I meant each and every word of it. He made me wait several minutes before he answered. I was beginning to pull my hair out. The relief I felt after reading it was indescribable. Okay, I accept your apology. Let this be a lesson to you. You never know who you're talking to and what they may know or are willing to do to get back at you. By this point, I was so spent from the shock of the last half hour, I could only answer with a thank you. I could only hope he meant what he said and my family was safe. In the end, my apology would have never have been made if I was the only person in danger. He could come over and do his best to whoop me, but the second my family became a target, no matter how mad it made me, I had no other option. You have to believe any man angry enough to threaten another's kids is crazy enough to carry them out. That's never a thing you should wager on. Moving on to this last year, my family and I were at the local Irish festival having a great time. My run-in with the guy from the chat room had faded from my mind. My daughters were at a booth getting their faces painted and I was sitting nearby taking a break with a beer. My wife was waiting in line for some snacks. I was sitting alone taking in the wonderful smells and sounds filling the air. Out of nowhere, a uniformed cop drops down next to me on the bench and says hello. I thought nothing of it and said hello back. Brent wanted me to let you know that he may have forgiven you but he hasn't forgotten. He pointed you out to me and asked I pass on the message. We police take care of each other, you see. Have a fun day. The cops stood up and quietly walked away. I was struck dumb. Not a word could form in my mind. I helplessly scanned the crowd, looking for what I didn't know. My daughters and wife carried on, clueless as to what had just occurred. I spent the remainder of the day constantly looking over my shoulder while trying to hide my fear from them. A day hasn't gone by since that I haven't been on guard. This year's festival is soon approaching and my daughters are highly anticipating it. My instincts tell me not to go, but doing that would only draw questions I'm not ready to answer. More than likely I'll be spending this weekend there searching the faces of every strange man and police officer wondering if my family is safe to enjoy themselves. I can only pray that his anger has cooled over time and last year's talk was nothing more than a gentle reminder 
to be kinder to my fellow man. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. If you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to always kiss your homies. Good night. <laughs>